If you have a Bible, Matthew chapter 24, we're just going to read a few verses, beginning with verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days of the, before the flood, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. In Luke chapter 17, verse 26, And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all, it says. I want to take you back, if I can, in your mind and in the Scripture to the garden before Noah, where the creation account describes everything. Everything that God created, everything that God designed, all the plants, all the flowers that are dead now because of the cold weather, <laughs> all the animals, all the stars, all the oceans and the seas, and even Adam himself, and God looked upon the creation, and God said, it's all good, very good. But one thing was not good, and it was not good for man to be, are you awake? <laughs> it's not good for man to be asleep, no, alone. <laughs> so God creates Eve, a woman, the beginning of marriage. The beginning of family, the beginning of community and culture. Relationships on earth outside of the one with God and Adam now begin. And out of that, society will emerge. People, men, women, children. And a day came when Adam and Eve chose to disobey their creator, God. God had said, you know, you can eat of any fruit of the garden, but not of this one. And they ate the forbidden fruit. And it brought deadly consequences for them and into our world. Sin at that point, disobedience against God entered the world. And the result was twofold. There was spiritual death. The beginning of physical death. Separation between man and God. They're cast out of the Garden of Eden. Forced out, the relationship with God and, and Adam was no longer the same. There was brokenness, there was pain, there was hurt, there was shame, there was hiding from God. So not only did that occur, but also a change in relationship between Adam and Eve. Eve was blamed by Adam. Eve blamed the serpent. That there was suddenly awareness and, and, and understanding of nakedness and shame. Tension arose between the very first married couple. Imagine tension in a marriage. I mean, that's unbelievable, isn't it? <laughs> they, they, they have two sons eventually, two boys, and sibling rivalry erupts between the two. Anger and jealousy and resentment are, are, are there within the home, there within the family. The boys, Cain and Abel, are in the midst of conflict. And it leads to the worst thing that could possibly happen in a family, a homicide between two brothers. Physical death is now a part of the planet and murder. Cain kills his brother, and he is separated from the family and begins a, a new separate community all on his own. He builds his own cities, tells us in Genesis. And now you have alienation of family and culture in the world, family members not getting along. Imagine family members not getting along. And by chapter 6 of Genesis... 
some say close to 2,000 years. Just six short chapters in the Bible. It tells us the whole world is filled with violence and evil. So, so God decides to, to judge the world. In Genesis chapter 6, listen to what it says. Imagine just, just six chapters into the Bible after creation when everything was good and God looked upon it and saw it and was pleased with it and created this wonderful Adam and Eve together. It tells us in verse 5 of Genesis 6, the Lord saw the wickedness of man. It was great in the earth. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I'll destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, birds of the air. I'm sorry that I made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so the Lord spared Noah. And God starts over. And we watch and, 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 and interact in our culture today. We, we see evil and lawlessness all around us. As it was in the days of Noah. I mean, I don't think there's a single one of us in the room that haven't been touched by some kind of evil or difficulty in life that we would say is part of the fall. I mean, I grew up in a family that at the age of 13, my parents divorced, and it created all kinds of issues in our lives. We, we just had Deidre come up and share about abortion that's crazy thing happening all over the world. The pornography industry has, has risen to all-time high. You and I turn on our news every day and not surprised when there's some kind of mass shooting or s stabbing. There's this crazy runaway fentanyl, opioid addiction thing happening. Teen suicide, wars, dictators, government corruption, judicial system that makes no sense, not to mention the destruction of the innocence of children going on in many of the public school systems. Amen. In Matthew chapter 18, I think we have this verse, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, now there, there is a, an evil force in our world, I believe it's Satan, that targets children. And I always tell parents, and, and this, is, this is, I think, been true in my life, if the enemy can't get you as a parent or an adult or, or your wife, then he goes after your children. And you have to fight for them. You have to pray for them. You have to work hard for them. My advice to parents was always this as they're raising kids, because Lynn and I have raised three, and now we've got a bunch of grandkids, is you, you, you either pay now or you pay later. And the price later is a lot higher than it is now in raising and disciplining your children. You either struggle and fight with them now and do those things you know you should do, or you struggle and fight with them later in life, and the price is a lot higher. It'd be better, it says, if one be... be, be if a millstone were hung around his neck, if he causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin. I don't know if you've ever seen a millstone. I was going to throw a picture of one up here. Uh, ancient millstones usually have a barb in that hole and, and, and either an animal or a couple of people would be pushing it around, grinding wheat or some kind of produce. And, and they're huge. I remember the first time I, I saw one in person was in the city of Capernaum uh, there in Israel. And, and imagine that being tied around your neck and you being thrown into the sea. Jews were afraid of the ocean as, and the sea as it was, but this would be like your worst nightmare. Okay, here we go. You, you've destroyed a little child, a little one, and now you're going to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around your neck. 
Whenever we talk about the end times or the, the Lord's return, you know, people like to, to set dates. They, they, they like to uh, uh, create a, a time frame. Uh, there's been many who've done this. In, in 1940, they had this uh, Conrad Harrison said the Lord was coming back in 1940 and that Mussolini was the Antichrist. In 1988, I think some of you might remember, this, this man named Edgar Wisnett wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Christ is Coming Back in 1988, and he sold over 2 million of those books. But how many of you know Jesus didn't come back in 1988? There was a Korean leader who said he was coming back October 28, 1992, Lee Rim. Harold Copling, the president of Family Radio, said he was coming back in 1994. Some set dates, some set times. Some are just skeptical and apathetic about the return of the Lord. And some are just, well, they're, they're just confused about it. Once again, in Matthew 24, it, it says to us in these verses, and I'll just read them again. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. The days of Noah. The Apostle Peter mentions many things in Scripture, but, but in, in this chapter in Matthew, chapter 24, Verse 44 says, therefore, as he's talking about the coming of the Lord, verse 44, there you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Just as the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. It'll come unexpectedly. The Apostle Peter told us in his second epistle in 2 Peter chapter 3, Verses 3 through 4. Knowing this, scoffers will come in the last days, walk according to their own lusts, and they'll ask, well, where's the promise? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So there'll be scoffers. There'll be people who are apathetic. We live in a time when people are looking at signs of the end, but not necessarily the signs of the end of Jesus coming back. There's all kinds of, of, of things happening in our world and, and people are, are saying things about, are we nearing the end? They see the wrath of, quote, Mother Earth, climate change, or, or the wrath of the mighty dollar, the, the collapse of economy as the end of time, or global roar, as we look at China and Russia, or some, some are afraid of the sort of the cosmic wrath. An asteroid or a comet might strike the earth and wipe out our planet. Some people sense some kind of impending disaster. But with that fear is not a sense of reverence or of God or, or the return of Christ. Most people would scoff or make fun if you believe in Christ, especially if you tell them about a flood or Jesus returning to the earth. We, we are in the midst, I believe, of a spiritual battle, and you and I are called to proclaim the gospel and the coming of Christ till he comes. You and I, in some ways, let me just say it like this, are little Noahs in an ungodly world. And God has called us to warn. He's called us to be prepared. Our text, Matthew chapter 24, of the day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And as it was in the days of Noah, godless attitudes, hatred, violence, moral craziness. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of the man was great in the earth, and that every intent and thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
Some say the flood was a fairy tale. Well, Christ said it was real. The Old Testament and the New Testament speak of the flood in Noah. The flood came suddenly and people had ignored the invitation of safety in the ark. The days of Noah, one characteristic in, in Scripture, I believe, is the population growth had gotten so large. Now, nothing wrong with population. The Scripture from the beginning, God said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. An increase of population, however, brings increase in all kinds of issues. You know this, I know this. More people, more issues. We have 14 grandkids. More people, more issues. I mean, just look at Highway 98. Or people, more issues. In 1972, the world population was 3.8 billion. Today, the population is 8 billion. Now, that's a, that's a huge jump. Scientists say, and I don't know how true this might be, but scientists say sustainable resources for food, water, habitation, environment would be maxed out at 9 to 10 billion. And we're at 8 billion. Recent years, we've had riots and food shortages. In Bengal, India, they had a huge famine in 2007. Venezuela in 2016 and 17 struggled with the same issue. South Africa in 2021. And recently in our own country during the COVID pandemic. Anyone remember the the hoarding and the buying panic that went on when, when people thought, oh, no, resources are slowing down. I know friends who live in large cities like San Diego, New York, Seattle, who bought all this excess food, generators, and stored them because the cities that they lived in were so large that the moment this possibility of not being able to get food and resources was mentioned because of the pandemic, the shelves in their Costco's and their local grocery stores were depleted almost immediately. You remember what it was like here. Imagine what it's like living in San Diego or New York where you've got masses and masses of people. A good friend of mine, he was storing food in his basement in San Diego. I said, what's with that? He goes, hey, as soon as anyone heard about this, I don't know if you've been to San Diego recently, he said Costco was out of almost everything. The book of Revelation tells us in the end time, food will be scarce and expensive. In Revelation chapter 6, 6, it says, And I heard a voice in the midst of four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. A denarius was a day's salary. A quart of wheat is enough for a loaf of bread. So, so it says in the end times you'll be paying a day's salary for a loaf of bread. I think the average hourly wage in the U.S. right now is anywhere from $20 to $25 an hour. If you're doing okay, that's $200 a day roundabout. So I'm paying $200 for a loaf of bread. In 1970, the loaf of bread was 25 cents. Has it gone up any since then? <laughs> I, I walked through Publix just checking bread prices. Whole grain Publix bread, nature's own, is $4.75 a loaf, almost $5, 20 times the price of 1970. When, when my wife and I bought our first house, it was here in Gulf Breeze. And we bought it in 1982. We bought it in Tiger Point. We had it built. And it was $35,000. You say, how stinking old are you? <laughs> the same house now goes anywhere from $275,000 to $300,000. Why? Well, population, scarce, scarcity of land. 
I mean, when, when, when Lynn and I first established a church here in 83 and we, we had our first house, you, you could drive all around this area where new subdivisions were being built. There was Tiger Point, there was Paradise Bay, there was all these different areas where you could build a house. How many of you know that's not true right now? You can't find a lot anywhere. It's a whole new world that we're living in. And this is just little Gulf Breeze. Zoning issues, scarcity of land, cost of materials, labor costs, taxes, etc., etc. We live somewhat in times like Noah's where the population is growing, scientists believe, at an unsustainable rate. In Genesis chapter 4, Take us back there. Tells us in verse 16. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod of the east of Eden after he had killed his brother. Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. It's, it's, it's a time of population growth at the time of building cities back in Genesis chapter 5. It's, it's, it's a time when things are, are changing. To Enoch was born Ired, and Ired begot me, and, and, and on and on it goes. Lamech took for himself two wives, and, and Adah bore Jabel, and his brother's name was Jubal, and it goes on and on and on and on about the growth that was going on population-wise in the earth at that time. Verse 22 tells about Zelah. She also bore Tubal, Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. So, So in that time, don't think that these are cavemen in Genesis. They're working with iron. They're working with bronze with metal for building and possibly the beginning of the science of metallurgy. Noah was given the task of building an ark. That takes a certain level of skill. I don't know if you've ever been out to the area of Cincinnati where they built an ark. It's huge. It's comparable in size to one of our ocean liners today. It's 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, And so that's an amazing feat of engineering to build something like that. Today we also have a rapid increase of knowledge. Before 1900, human knowledge doubled every 100 years. By the end of World War II, knowledge doubled every 25 years. Today experts believe that human knowledge doubles every 13 months. And because of artificial intelligence and the internet, it will soon double every 12 hours. You know, with, with artificial intelligence, now they can do so much more than they ever could do. They're even using it to detect skin cancer. And knowledge, for the most part, is good. I mean, bring it on, right? But without godly wisdom and a foundation of truth... It's a whole different story. And I would cite the COVID-19 pandemic as, as uh, part of that issue. I don't know if you ever heard this term, gain of function. Gain of function. And many believe that's what was going on in, in, in China with this experiment on a bat. A gain of function is a term about research to alter the function of an organism that it enhances its ability to function at a higher level. It includes genetics, molecular uh, altering, all types to create a more effective organism. But knowledge like that, without godly wisdom and boundaries, Well, it creates all kinds of greed and selfishness and pride, which always leads to deceit and conflict. And and this is the social and and spiritual context of Noah's day, population growth, uh, men who are, are, are greedy, who are evil, and human wickedness brought about judgment in Noah's day. Now, Do you think our society today would give off an aroma of evil at all? Through the media, 
through college campuses, through the entertainment industry, through government corruption. The, the culture we live in today, for the most part, ignores God's moral law and absolutes. They call them old-fashioned, outdated, not realistic, not true. Everywhere you look and hear violence and theft skyrocketing. And the government, which God established government to maintain order and protect the innocent and punish the guilty, now many times seems to do just the opposite. Amen. And you stand amazed. For at least five months in 2020, cities were burned, they were looted, police were ordered to stand down, and stores were shut down all over major cities because city officials refused to prosecute shoplifting and other street crimes. San Francisco, Seattle, New York, Los Angeles, many of the streets even today in those downtown areas given over to crime and homelessness, and, and many of them are addicted to drugs, and crime and chaos abound. And the police have a crisis on their hands. We have an epidemic in our culture today of the shedding of innocent blood. It's there. Hamas attacking innocent citizens of Israel October 7th with brutal, indiscriminate murders. Uh, my wife won't even watch that news. John, turn it off. Turn it off. I don't want to hear it. And we could talk about 2014, 2015, ISIS attack on Syria and Iraq was just as bad. The South Sudan and the ethnic cleansing there in 2013. Our, our own nation, as we heard earlier, the abortion struggle. 62% of American approve of legalized abortion. And one in five pregnancies today in America end in abortion. One in five. Biblical ethics and morality in America is rapidly disappearing. Churches with doctrinal stances adjust to culture and lifestyles, not the scripture. And if, if I ever, and this has happened to me over and over again, if I venture into passage of scripture that in any way condemn homosexuality, there's always someone who gets up and walks out. We live in a time when churches don't believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, where churches don't believe in the virgin birth or the resurrection or, or, or Satan as a real enemy or, or the second coming of Christ. Churches who no longer see or give any response to sexual sin or immorality. Believers who are involved in sex outside of marriage justify it with some kind of self-serving image of a grandpa-loving God who just wants me to be happy. We need to be Noah's warning. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Our media and school systems are robbing our children of their innocence and seem everything today, listen, centers around race, gender, identity, inclusive, tolerant indoctrination. It's a crazy runaway train. Isn't this an encouraging message today? <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of the genderbred person that circulates around public schools. It has to do with identity based on attraction and sexual expression, not the biological sex. It's identity and attraction and sexual expression that determines gender. Books in school libraries are a hot debate, even recently in Escambia County. I don't know 
there was a there's an ongoing right now battle. I think it's ongoing. I saw it in the news recently about schools in Scambia County about a book called All Boys Aren't Blue. I don't know if you heard about this or saw this. It's written by LGBTQIA activists. And it's been in the Scambia County schools. It was taken out now. I think they want to put it back. It's a series of essays following the author. He, he, who, who's a, uh, he calls himself that he, he grew up as a queer black man in Plainfield, New Jersey, in a very abusive family. And the book's very descriptive about his sexual encounters and the difficulties we have. We, we have these programs, these groups in public schools now called CSE, Comprehensive Sex Education, and SEL, Social Emotional Learning. One book in the CSE promotes a book called It's Perfectly Normal, and the things within the book which promote sexual lifestyles, which I would say, and the scripture would say, are not perfectly normal. So if you have children in, in the school system May I just encourage you to go to the board meetings, go, go to the parents' meetings, as it was in the days of Noah, were there. In 2016, I was walking through some of the buildings, and the Lord just spoke to me. I never, ever wanted to start a school. We have enough problems with people as it is. <laughs> But I was walking through those buildings over there, and the Lord said, John, look at all this space you have here. You could have a school. This is, this is before COVID and all, all that began to happen. And, and I said, well, Lord, I don't want to run a school. Then you're dealing with parents and their children and children and grandparents. And, you know, those issues, Lord, are so much different. And the Lord said, yeah, but look at all these empty rooms all week long just sitting here. So 2016, we started a preschool. And now at 2024, we've got three modulars sitting out there. The school's overcrowded. I don't even know how many teachers we have and teachers' aides we have. And the school's just, you know, they, they, they changed some laws. And I got a call from uh, one of the senators that, that's a friend of mine, Doug Broxson. He said, hey, do you know what's going on, you know, with, with the ad valorem tax? They're going to release it next, and, and you guys are going to be able to have kids come to your school, and da-da-da-da-da. And now we've got this, this school, and thank God for it. It's a, it's a great school. Kids are flooding into it. They're learning the Bible. They're, they're, they're quoting scripture. They're, they're giving a biblical worldview. And, and we've got just this waiting list. And here's how we established the school. The school was to be not a separate entity from the church, but that it would be just like any other ministry of the church. It'd be like our women's ministry, our children's ministry, our adult ministry, it's a ministry to the families and the children that God brings to the school. And about, I think it was a month or two ago, Pastor Neil and I met with uh, an engineering group. We met with an architect, and we talked about we'd like to build a school because we just don't have room anymore. I mean, they, they meet in here for now for special things, for events and uh, it's an amazing amount of work to maintain. We have to have uh, janitors who clean that place every day, every night. And then there's events. And uh, Does this sound like I'm griping and complaining? <laughs> no, it, it's a wonderful thing. But here's the thing. So, okay, we need to build a building. We need a, we need a larger facility for all these kids and, and a playground and all this kind of stuff. So I, I call up the bank. I go, hey, I think we're going to need to borrow some money to build this building. He goes, well, send us your, your financial reports. So send my financial reports. We have one, a guy in the church who, who's a banker, and he called me back. He goes, well, John, you guys are doing okay, but you know what? You spend every penny that you bring in. I go, I know. We have staff here, we have staff there, we got buildings, uh, utilities went up, the, now they're on all the time for the school, and da-da-da-da. He goes, well, we may be able to loan you maybe a million dollars. That would be the, I go, really, that's it? He goes, yeah. So he say, John, why are you saying this? We need some money. 
if you would like to donate, <laughs> if you have a heart for kids and for Christian education, it won't be turned down. That's all I got to say. It says that in the days of Noah, they were eating, drinking, marrying, going on with regular life. Nothing wrong with that at all, eating, drinking, and marrying. It, it, it implies that life was going on as normal to them. And, and, and I would say this, that eating and drinking is an obsession in our culture today. <laughs> And marriage today, unfortunately, is anything you want it to be. Two people, any gender, three people, probably almost divine, beyond Noah's culture. We have redefined it. In 2 Peter chapter 2, it says, And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those afterward who would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For the righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day, seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. You and I are called to be Noah's in our culture. Listen, prepared, telling others, lovingly warning that Jesus came to love, to forgive, and to save. And I believe he'll come again. Personally, as a believer, you and I have a call on our lives to be obedient to be a witness, to be salt, to be light, to take as many people as you and I can to heaven with us. But also at the same time, to save them from the impact of sin today. We, we talked about, and we just did a, we did a simple little three-part series. Neil started off talking about the call on our lives individually to be saved and to do good works. Last week, we looked a little bit at the end time prophecy and how Israel is a filter to process or watch the news. And today, I just wanted to share a little bit about that we live in a time like the times of Noah and that the coming of the Lord is soon. We, we, we look at, you know, population. We, we, we look at the, 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 the scenario that's going on in our culture of evil, we look at all the different things that are happening around us. And, 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 and my response to it is, for you and I, uh, that we have a responsibility to warn. You know, my, my wife and my daughter kicked off this, this read through the Bible. And... Uh, it's a wonderful thing. Tons of women signed up to read through the Bible, and, and my wife's been hassling me. John, why don't you read through the Bible with me? Oh, I've, I've taught through the Bible. No, no, but why don't you read it through with me? Oh, with you. So, so she, she made me sit down and watch all these Tara Lee Cobble or something like that videos and, and the one thing I like about the approach that the women are taking is, as they're reading through the Bible chronologically, they're, they're not looking for anything else really other than who is God and how do I relate to him. And that he's where you find true joy in life. So I'm reading through the Bible with, with my wife right now. And I would encourage you guys, if your wife is reading through the Bible... Read through the Bible. It's not going to hurt you. In fact, it will draw you back into an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ that everyone needs. Amen? You need it. I need it. 
Because here's the deal. We live in a culture in a time like the days of Noah. And if you're not careful, your heart can become very desensitized to the sin and the selfishness in your own life. And you need God's Word to lovingly and carefully open it up again and reveal to you that there is a God who has created boundaries and he, He's created things in your life and my life to keep us from drifting into those things that He's opposed to and that our culture has so widely opened its arms to. And we need to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves, living as little Noahs in the world that we're in today. Because here's the thing. Christ is coming back. Now you say, well, everybody's been saying that forever. Yeah, but you know what? One thing for certain. We're closer than we've ever been before. Amen. And we live in a culture that's more wicked than it's ever been before. And to that I can only say, even so, come Lord Jesus. And let's take as many people with us to heaven as we possibly can.